public instead. Where I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? The women with the least likelihood of getting pregnant are the ones most worried about having abortions. On January 6th of 2021, you had tens of thousands of people peacefully protesting. So, it's not a right-wing conspiracy theory. It's not QAnon. It's real. <laughs> Hey folks, and welcome back to The Enemies List. I'm your host, Rick Wilson. Today, is my guest is Timothy Schenk. He is an historian of the modern U.S., and he has written a couple of very interesting books about how our politics in this country have been evolving, both on the left and the right. Um, but in a particular, uh, in a particular aspect, uh, he is, I think, examined in a way the the changes on the American political left, and with a lot of granularity, that is really fascinating to me. So. I want to talk a little bit about his book today, Left Adrift, What Happened to Liberal Politics. And Timothy, welcome to the show. And talk to us about, you know, where liberal politics is going in this country. I know this book is coming out in a couple of weeks. Uh, and I think it's important that that we have a, a an insight into what you were able to observe about the evolution of the professional class of the party, um, the, the, the emergent think tank universe around the party's uh, elections and and their hope that they could tech their way out of some of the problems. Talk to us a little bit about the book because I'm I'm fascinated by this topic. Well, so the big question that the book is trying to think through is what happens to parties like the Democrats, so center left parties when they can no longer count on bedrock support from working class voters. And mm -hmm. you can shorthand this transformation as saying, not that long ago, unions were the base of these kinds of parties. Today, it looks more like universities. And that's going to be a big change. Right? It's not that Democrats or other center left parties around the world have completely lost touch with the working class, but it's not the natural base anymore. And at the same right. time that a lot of working class voters have moved to the center or even to the right, a lot of professional, educated, often affluent voters have moved to the left. So inevitably, that's going to change the party. And I wanted to think through what that looks like and the costs as well as the gains. OK, so <clears throat> talk to us about uh, when the party started to evolve into this more not only its base, but it, I mean, because the, the base has been evolving very rapidly towards a um, towards a, a a much more, you know, as you as you note, highly educated slightly more affluent, slightly more, you know, suburban and urban party um, and away from some of those working class roots. But it's also become this sort of technocratic enterprise at the same time. Talk to us a little bit about how that, uh, how that, when, when you see those inflection points of having sort of broached and, and, and go into a little more depth on that. Yeah, so one important thing to keep in mind is that class politics, you know, where the poor vote for one party, the rich vote for another party, and the middle class is up for grabs, that's not actually the norm in American history or around much of the world today. Class is a really, really important social fact, and it's, it structures how all of us live our lives. But when people decide how to vote, it is just one among a lot of different factors that people can consider. They can think about their religion, they can think about their race, they can think about any number of different things. And what you see happening within a lot of left parties is a shift from what you could think of as this 50 years ago, a kind of bottom up coalition where you really are doing strongest with voters at the bottom of the scale and you lose support as you go up. That's been replaced by a kind mm -hmm. of U shape where you're really strong at the bottom with the bottom 20% and really strong with the top 20% and everything in the middle gets trickier. And of course, the problem that Democrats are facing today, staring down the barrel of a potential second Trump administration, is that the numbers just aren't there to build a durable electoral majority in the United States. And that's a really big challenge. So one of the compromises the Republicans made when they got into, the, into bed with Trump um, was stated by one of Mitch McConnell's chief aides, a guy named Josh Holmes. He said, you know, if we can take Trump's working class base without the crazy, we can have a permanent governing majority. Um, and I, I always found that to be a sort of dangerous, dangerous relationship with with Trump and Trumpism, because you don't you don't get it without the crazy. It, it, the crazy is part of it. Um, what are the compromises the Democratic Party has made by by this 
real or tacit or, uh, you know, or deliberate or accidental divorce from a lot of the working class. It's well, it's I think it's a flip side of and I think that's a really great way of phrasing the Trump, the right, the dilemma for the right. Can you get the voters without getting the crazy? But the flip side of that and the dilemma that, that, that Democrats are facing is, can you even pretend to be a populist party when you're being sort of drawn into becoming the party of institutions, the party of everything right. is fine, the party of if we just get smart people with good plans in charge, then everything is going to work. And that's particularly troubling in this year for them because so many voters want change and they don't believe that everything is going fine. And the great challenge that Kamala is facing is we've seen that she's able to get pretty far on vibes and a turn the page sense of just Joe Biden won't be around anymore. Isn't that good enough? But that there are a lot of voters out there, the voters who are going to decide this election, who don't think that vibes are enough, who don't think that just changing the face of the person at the top is enough and want a sense that something's going to be different. And voters have been saying this for a long time. I think it's, gosh, I don't know when the last time that a majority of Americans have said that the country is on the right track. It might literally be more than 20 years at this point. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. there's been so much frustration building up for so long that a party of institutions and everything is fine is just never going to be able to speak to that, speak to those concerns as plausibly as a more populist Republican party, even if Republicans have to deal with the downside of the crazy. So uh, the Democrats, uh, the, I think they're starting to recognize sort of slowly and painfully that that if you box out the working class, if you hand them over to the Republicans, if you if you basically give them away to the Republican Party, you're in a world of political hurt going forward. And I think I think the Harris campaign has started to to deflect or reflect back onto that um, pretty effectively, but I, I don't think they're there yet. What would you be doing if you were advising the Democratic Party at that level on on how do you start communicating with the working class again in a way that doesn't – and look, I've been in a, in a hundred focus groups where I have rank-and-file working class Democrats say, I don't want to hear any more bullshit from Washington about that I'm going to become a solar panel installer or any of that. They, they're really yeah. – they're bitter about it. How would you start to heal that divide with Republicans or with, with working it's class It's something voters? I've been – it's something I've been thinking through a lot for obvious reasons. This yeah. is like the great question that the Harris campaign is facing at the moment. And we just have to be honest, like they don't have a lot of time. They have the candidate who they have, who she has lots of strengths, but she just doesn't have the kind of muscle memory that would come from having run campaigns oriented toward these kinds of voters before. You know, she is yeah. just inevitably a product of a sort of California political ecosystem where if you're trying to train someone from the bottom up, you know, she's not Bill Clinton in Arkansas in 1980, and she's never going to be. And right. there's going to be a hurdle with a lot of voters that we just have to acknowledge that it's to the extent that some of these voters you want to get in the TED are sort of, blue collar, often white, often older working class voters, then there's mm -hmm. going to be, for the same reason that Harris has gotten a bump over Biden with younger voters, with women voters, with non-white voters, like identity is a signal. It's an important one. And so she's going to have mm -hmm. more of a, there are going to be more hurdles to jump through to get in touch with those white working class voters who are really, really crucial in those obviously sort of like swing, blue, blue wall, Midwestern, Rust Belt states. But I think that policy has to be this in the time that she has clear moves on policy that I think importantly signal a break with the Biden administration. You know, there people talk a lot about sister soldier moments. It's Bill Clinton mm -hmm. in 1992, mm -hmm. sort of tis tisking at Jesse Jackson for turning the other way on this controversial rapper. And sister soldiers often use as a shorthand for a big public break with the left. I think that's what's more important for Kamala right now is almost like a sister soldier moment with the Biden administration. What is an issue that she can pick to signal clear distance with Biden on that speaks to the concerns of this group of voters who I call burn it down moderates, where right. they have sort of a set of issues where often they sort of lean, they have populist instincts on economics, and they're somewhere to the center or even conservative on a lot of culture war issues. Mm -hmm. And they have been the key swing voters in American politics going back decades. And to they, what makes them significant, what makes them moderate is that they 
have this sort of resistance. They feel that the game is rigged against them. They're deeply skeptical of elites, but they don't fall neatly into either the Elizabeth Warren or the Ted Cruz camp, right? They're not strict right. conservatives. They're not strict leftists. Obviously, they don't pay that much attention to politics. They actually don't, I think, expect an enormous amount. They just want their lives to be better than they are now. And they don't understand why people are fighting all the time about this. And to the extent, and they don't like where the country's been going for a long time, and especially under Biden. And I think to the extent, if there, you know, if it was easy, it would be done now. But something right. that allows Kamala to put herself as a defender of the middle working class who understands how hard things have been in the Biden years and is going to deliver them something that's really different, not just because she doesn't look like Joe Biden, but she's going to govern differently like f- from Joe Biden. And she understands the anger that people are feeling now. This is not necessarily her natural skill set, but that because these voters are so important and because we live in a democracy and they should have a voice. This is the number one issue I think that should be on her agenda in the sprint to election day. You know, I think that's a really interesting insight into this because there is a, there is an interesting overlap in, and as you said, you know, they're not, they're not Ted Cruz and they're not Elizabeth Warren. I think on the, on the Warren side of it, you get some of the democratic party that I've seen in focus groups and I've seen in, in, in research over the years, where, you know, it's the, when you tell those voters that those working, those guys that are, you know, out working on, on, on a highway project somewhere or out working construction and you tell them, well, here's my 900 page job retraining plan. They're just, their reaction is like, get the fuck out of here. Who, who are you talking to? This is, you know, it, it's completely detached from their lives. It feels like a Washington, you know, uh, an empty Washington promise and that sort of thing. Um, and, and, and so, you know, uh, that, that strikes me as a as something she that she would profit from, especially if she keeps it in the frame of some of the things she's been doing right now that have been very simple and straightforward. I want to get your thoughts on this. Uh, she's talking about a twenty five thousand dollar first time home buyer credit. She's talking about a six thousand uh, dollar child credit. She's talking about an increase in the child care tax credit. All those things. They are simple. They are plain numbers. They're not an amorphous kind of plan. They are a set of you know one two three four promises. Um, what do you think about that approach uh, that she's taken so far? It's it's tough because I agree that it's not the worst version of the here's my 12 step process for solving a problem that maybe yep. you care about, but probably don't. But it's still hard to get people to care about that type of thing. Right. And I think what's really crucial is that. And this is why it's hard to find the specific issue. But the best case scenario is something that allows her to distance herself from Biden and for Trump. Right. You need to not just take a position, Mm -hmm. but you need to get people to care about it. And the way to get care about it is to be fighting with it on the other side. And it might help if it was a little bit oversimplified. So the classic instance of this for Trump is build a wall. Right. It's not necessarily that every person believes that these every person who likes Trump on immigration wants a wall in the first place or believes that they were going to get a wall or that Mexico is going to pay for it. But it was a way of shining a spotlight on this issue that really mattered to his voters and that resonated with that burn it down moderate group and that Democrats got pissed off on the other side and wanted to fight over. Right. And right, right. the concern that I have is just that my latest tax credit is never going to have the type of juice that build a wall does. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. this is the tricky thing. Of, there was a time, you know, I have very, very distinct, like Bernie Kratz sympathies. You know, that is where I come from in the party. Sure, sure. I'm on the left. And, the, and there was a time when I thought that the best solution to build a wall was Medicare for all. Right. You beat one slogan with another slogan and one that's easy to understand and comprehensible. That's not what Kamala's going to do. I think there are a lot of problems with that as a strategy for right now. But still, figuring out something that can put Trump back on the defensive as not just the sort of blue collar working class Republican who's taking on the elites and can challenge the establishment, whether you like him or not, he's going to bring change. Pick the thing that lets Kamala get back in touch with what has always been the Democrats' strongest issue, which is we are the party of working people. Right, right. And and it's interesting because, uh, again, Trump is not offering them anything in particular other than I think it's sort of, you know, uh, the the classic opiates of the bad people are coming and I will stop them. You you should be afraid of these guys. You know, it's like uh, the point I make all the time to folks is, it's like, look, McKinsey took more jobs from working class Americans than the Mexicans ever did by by an order of magnitude. And 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 those are the people that Trump and I've 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 been interesting, like I, I'm wondering how the Democrats, they kind of feel like they've missed that beat. You know, they, they are always like, oh, the billionaires, the billionaires, oh, great. But but Trump's weird vulgarity about the whole thing and this weird 
this weird concept that the that the Trump's tax tax cut helped anybody other than hedge fund bros and very high net worth individuals. Um, it just strikes me they they still seem to have missed a beat on how they communicate about that. Well, the problem, too, is that Trump does has the advantage of I did this before and you remember what the economy was like before COVID. And just most people, unfortunately, from my perspective, don't blame him for anything that happened after March 2020. And right. they remember the Trump years as a period of rising paychecks and cheap mortgages. And what's Biden, by contrast, it was declining real wages for the median American in the first two years that he was in office mm -hmm. at the same time that interest rates were going through the roof. And so yep. it is like an affordability crisis that did not exist in the same way before he took charge. And this is the underrated aspect of this. People talk about a kind of racial dealignment that happened in between 2016 mm -hmm. and 2020 with Trump doing better with Latino voters and even especially African-American men that what is the single best answer for that? Well, that he moderated enough on those entitlement questions so that people didn't think that a vote for Trump was a vote against Social Security. And he just had the track record of the economy before COVID was pretty good. And that economy looks even better now than in 2024 than it did at the time. So I think, and there is the additional disadvantage too of people, if you memory hold January 6th, then the story of the Trump administration is, well, it was messy and chaotic, but it wasn't Hitler 2.0. <laughs> and so it's sort of the worst case scenarios that you and me and everyone else was saying, like, I remembered how terrified I was on election night 2016. And I will be very, very unhappy in election night 24 if things go the way that they looks like they might right now. But just the fact is that for most people who don't want to care that much about politics and just want their life to get a little bit better, there's a story they can tell themselves about how voting for Trump now Whatever happened last time that made the economy better can happen again, and I don't have to worry about the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk a little bit about the book, Timothy. Um, and it, it's in some ways a story of Stan Greenberg and Doug Schoen, two very prominent Democratic consultants and pollsters. Um, talk to us a little bit about – tell us their story a little bit and about how it reflects the changes in the Democratic Party over the last couple of decades. Great. So both of them are these political consultants who have been around for ages. They were both advisors to Bill Clinton in the 90s. Mm -hmm. But with that background, you might think that they would be just sort of potentially the best of friends. But as a former consult as former member of the consultant class and good standing, you know that no, 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 no. These are the no. being a consultant <laughs> is the beginning of like a like, yeah, a ticket for like lifelong rivalries, grudges. And the grudge that developed between these two, I think, is significant, not just because they didn't like each other terribly much, but because they had fundamentally different prescriptions for what Democrats should do when they could no longer count on automatic support from a broad swath of working class voters. Mm -hmm. Both of them, they're baby boomers. They came of age in the last days of that New Deal coalition when it was obvious right. that Democrats were the party of organized labor and Republicans were the party of big business and country clubs. They saw right. that coming apart in the 1960s. Both of them, mm -hmm. they're frighteningly smart in a way that Very me as or Obama bro coming Obama bro to Bernie guy from 2008 to 2016 my temptation was always just to write off everyone from the Clinton years as sort of the kind of silly people I saw yelling at each other on cable TV and the mm -hmm. big revelation for me is that before a lot of this pundit generation turned into almost caricatures of themselves on the evening news they were really really sharp thinkers who took this problem seriously Greenberg talked about it in an academic career that started with a PhD at Harvard, then went to him teaching at Yale in the early 1980s. Mm -hmm. For Schoen, it was, he was a Harvard undergrad who wrote a book on this question of class, what political scientists call class dealignment, when you no longer have, again, that mm -hmm. automatic working class support for Democratic parties. He wrote a dissertation on Oxford that looked at a similar version of this process happening in the UK. And what they did, Greenberg and Schoen, they both said this question of class dealignment is the central question facing parties like Democrats, but they came up with completely different responses for how to address it. Greenberg right. believes and like believed at the time and still believes, and he's most known today, by the way, I think probably for his association with James Carville, like they went into business sure. together. And you can think of Greenberg almost as sort of the academic PhD behind it's the economy stupid. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. his argument was that if Democrats 
ran hard on economic populism and moderated on the culture war, they would be able to put that New Deal coalition back together. And for him, this is almost an evangelical issue of real moral importance. He's a Bobby Kennedy Democrat in a lot of ways who saw that coalition coming together in 1968 around Bobby Kennedy, a candidate who did well with white working class voters and with African-American voters. And to Green, from Greenberg's perspective, the tragedy of the Democratic Party is this transformation into a professional, more educated coalition. Now, Schoen also believes that working class voters are significant, but he's more open to bringing in those professional class, educated, affluent suburbanites. Mm -hmm. The thing is, though, that for Schoen, what really matters is he thinks that after the 1960s, after the collapse of that New Deal coalition, that class politics just isn't going to get the job done. And what Democrats need to do is make themselves more like Republicans across the board. So our politics is just a comprehensive battle for that voter dead in the center and that a mix of tacking to the center on economics and also claiming the center on the culture war. That's the only way you're going to survive in an electoral climate where he thinks for most of his career, the natural majority at a national level is Republican, not Democratic. And instead of promising a potential for a great realignment or a resurrection of the New Deal order, Sean is just saying that it's always going to be a scramble. It's always going to be a death match. But if you move to the center as aggressively as aggressively as possible this is the way democrats can at least survive to the next time mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and it is interesting because you know uh, the the famous carville line from from 1992 was you know we didn't break the electoral lock that the republicans had at the time we just picked it and and so one of the ways that, that the democrats i think effectively started to compete in the post clinton era was they did start to rely more on data. They did start to rely more on targeting. They did start to rely more on migrating a lot of the ways they 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 organized and operated their campaigns into the digital space. Talk to us a little bit how about how that evolution and revolution in democratic politics has changed the game for them. And it has it's tough to say that it changes the game permanently, right? Because the problem is that Republicans can do this stuff too. Uh, the, right. On the tech side, it's always a battle for the next, what's the next opportunity? What's the next advantage? Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. really you have to think about the data revolution unfolding alongside the hope of the emerging Democratic majority. And this is the argument that gains traction starting in the George W. Bush years, that demographic changes, the country is becoming less white and more educated, that no longer do Democrats have to assume that they are living in Reagan country, that that yeah. underlying shown pessimism about what the party can do allows them to be more ambitious and that you Obama 2012 ends up becoming a it, it's a, a, almost a catastrophic victory for a certain type of Democrat because it allows them to tell themselves that the victory lab dorks in the in the <laughs> IT department or the quants coming up with a strategy that combined with demographics is enough to seal the case for us. And that sort of arrogance really becomes an animating principle of the Clinton campaign in 2016, which sure. does have a real economic message that's trying to put out there. But it's not trying that hard, actually. What I always think about is it's <laughs> running much more ag- against Trump, pure, purely against Trump, and really against Trump as a sort of cultural monster. It's kind of, I think it's a little bit forgotten now, but does anyone like, remember Alicia Machado? I, the, the former it's like Trump era, it was like Miss Beauty, what, Miss USA, mm-hmm. whatever contestant, who out of the Trump, out of the first presidential debate, what was the thing that the Clinton campaign wanted to talk wanted to talk about? How Donald Trump had made vulgar and stupid comments about this woman, Alicia Machado, right? right. She, Clinton wanted to wage a campaign over who was on the right side of the culture wars. And for Greenberg and Schoen, when they were coming of age, the assumption was always that culture wars, loser for Democrats, have to figure out a way around, have to figure out a way around that. And Clinton 2016 was based on the hope that Trump was so extreme and unacceptable on the cultural front, and the country had changed so much that finally Democrats could, in a sense, be the party that some activists had always wanted them to be. And mm-hmm, that looked mm-hmm. like a not terrible bet, partly because those quants had been saying that the numbers are good, the numbers are good, we're, they're there for us, we can predict these things, we know how it's going to shake out. All looked like a really good bet right up until election night 2016. <laughs> well, I also think Hillary made a, uh, I think, and this is a mistake, I think Harris has thus far avoided. I think Hillary made the mistake of, you know, the the whole I'm with her was an internally facing thing. It was back to her, back to her. And, and you know, the 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 Harris campaign has been I'm with you. And I, it's an externally facing message, which I find, 
Uh, I think that was kind of a a, a a a differential in the two so far that I think has been very smart. I think that's been a very wise way to approach that. Um, so I want to I want to you know talk about one more thing about the the evolution of the party. As you end up with a more educated, uh, you know, Democratic Party and a and a. I won't say less educated, but but a larger percentage of the Republican Party are non-college whites. Um, a larger percentage of the Republican Party are not um, are not in the are, are not, you know, are not folks that that come from that sort of separated culture you get with academia and with and with the affluence of modern academia. Uh, is there a, is there a, in your mind? And I, this is kind of looping back on an earlier question, but it's still sort of haunting me. Is there in your mind a way to make those cultures um, or to, to speak from that culture to the working class white voters who are who, who have been the thing that's been the rocket fuel for Trump? Is there a way in your mind that 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 there's a better way to communicate with them? And again, like I said, I know it's sort of looping back, but I'm, I'm sort of semi obsessed with this question. So am I. I'm happy to loop back as much as we need to get the final <laughs> definitive resolution of this. Uh, and partly, you know, I'm aware, like I'm writing a book. Yeah, exactly. I'm writing a book that who's the target audience for it? It's a type of people who I'm sort of lecturing. It is those educated college types like me, like almost everyone that I know. Yep. Yep. But I, one way to guilt trip those educated progressive types into taking this question seriously is to point out that it's no longer just the white working class. That why if Trump wins in 24, it's going to be because, yes, he blows the roof off with blue collar whites, but he right. is gaining ground with Hispanic voters. And again, like some mm -hmm. African-American men, and it is a specific type. It is the non-college working class voters it, that sort of the breakdown of that racial structure of American politics. And if the Democrats want to be either the working class party that they were under Roosevelt or the party of a multiracial America that it seemed like they could become a multiracial majority that seemed like they could become under Obama and Clinton, then they need to fix this problem. And yep. I think it starts by me, folks like us talking to me, like this slice of the new democratic coalition and saying, if we are in fact as tolerant and sophisticated and compassionate as we say we are, then we have to realize that we can be on the bus, but we don't get to drive it. And to take seriously the fact that there are people who have a different set of concerns, they have a different set of values, and that there is something, this is where I get kind of soppy and romantic about democracy, to say uh -huh. that a system that can give ordinary people more control over the life economically, and that makes them feel as if they are being hurt culturally. The Bill Clinton line from 92, which I actually love, even though I have a lot of problems with how Clinton tried to put into practice, but it was defend the interests and honor the values of the people who elected us, of ordinary Americans. I think that progressive, well enough off blue voters should be able to be as moved by that ideal as I am. And because that is what democracy means. And it is both, I think it's good policy. I also think it's great politics. And if that mm -hmm. doesn't persuade these people, I don't know what will, but I want to try. You know, I, yeah, I think that, I think that idea is, and it's one thing, look, and I think, yes, part of it is the Democrats fault for that, for allowing that to, to be, become the frame they were in. Part of it is the Republicans have very, very smartly exploited it. And back when I was a Republican, we would very, very smartly exploit this kind of thing. This was not this was not a a a, a difficult uh, exploitation. It was a it was a standard issue exploitation. It was something we did without even breaking a sweat um, of of saying these eggheads are looking down on you. These smart guys want to tell you how to live your life. They they hate you. They're they, they they view you with contempt, all those sort of things. And it really is. It really was something I think the Democrats were, were very flat footed about responding to for a long time. Yeah, and I think the best way to show, and listen, not every candidate is going to be able to make the most plausible version of this case, because I think the most plausible version of Democrats don't look down on you comes from any number of sort of the new crop of working class Democrats who sure. are coming down the pipeline now. But even someone who comes from a comparatively well, well off background, like Fetterman, you know, personality, how you present yourself, all those intangible cultural things, mm -hmm. it matters that you're signaling that you're not just the latest model from the Ivy League assembly line. 
But I think, right. and this is a point that I take from Shone, who, by the way, even if you don't know who Shone is, should uh, mention this earlier, Mark Penn, his leading uh, partner who becomes sort of go-to center-left <laughs> consultant, Shone and Penn are partners from forever, for forever. And just as Greenberg was kind of the brains behind Is Economy Stupid, Shone was the one who really came up with the, the theory that Penn built his career around. But something that they both hammer again and again is that vibes alone won't get the job done, that it's policy. And to take us back to Kamala, even if she's never going to be the sort of John Fetterman that some sort of Rust Belt voters might want, she can still signal on policy that she understands them and that there are a lot of these sort of swing voters who, in a weird way, the people who are mo who can you can get the most ground with based on vibes and persona are the hardcore partisans on either side because they're already with you on the issues. Like Kamala can send Democrats into euphoria just by being cooler than Joe Biden because Democrats know that they support her on 90% of the issues already. Right. But right. those up for grabs voters, even though they don't pay a lot, a lot of attention to politics, that means that the upside of that is that they're not invested in one of the tribes deeply already and that they just want to understand how this election can benefit from them. What are you offering me that could make a difference in my life? And to the extent that Kamala can pick fights on easy to understand issues that put her in touch with those voters, and then those fights, they're not going to be about vibes. They're going to be about policy. That's the thing that they can do, even if she's never going to be, you know, like a board shorts and all the rest. Uh, Democrat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fetterman is a unique, a unique figure in that regard. And uh, who's done very well for himself that way. He has built a brand that works for him. And that's not always easy in politics because our both sides have a tribalism now that wants you to like fit into the constraints of of you know what the media outlets in that party want you to be. They they're they're much more nationalized than they used to be. Um so one last question. Uh, you, you were talking about that. Where do you see Tim Walls fitting into that, like not off the standard Ivy League? uh assembly line thing i i think he's done well for her i think he's i think he's helped the ticket kind of meaningfully in that regard because he does come across as a much more you know authentic suburban american dad and less as you know the guy who you know went to private school went to an elite college went to you know london school of economics he's he comes across as a very authentic sort of representative of the of the the working class yeah. I and mean, the thing is, though, as with the Harris campaign as a whole, I think that's definitely true, but it also shows the limits of how far vibes can get you, where when Walls was able to survive in a reddish district when he positioned himself, not just stylistically, but substantively as mm -hmm. not a standard national Democrat. And even in Minnesota, as he rose up in the state level and moved more to the progressive Democratic side of the spectrum, he lost ground with the type of voters who had been more open to him when he was Congressman Walls. So the Governor Walls Coalition of 22 was not the Tim Walls Congressman Coalition of 2006. Right. So That's he right. helps. But again, substance, that like, the policy, as he changed on policy, his coalition changed too. I'm not saying that policy was the only factor there. When you're moving up to the state level, you just become more associated with the national Democratic brand, but it was a factor. Still, the thing that I would advise Democrats or progressives against is saying that, well, just because we can't be maximalist on every issue on the progressive wish list doesn't mean capitulating to the other side completely and trying to roll back the clock to the Stone Age. I think the really important thing for progressives to remember is that the alternative to the right, the alternative to standard, the, rather, yeah, the alternative to MAGAism doesn't have to be a maximalist progressive position on the other side, that there is a middle ground and that a lot of these voters who might be drawn to Trump on like already based on the economic record and everything else, they are not hard line cultural conservatives who are mainlining Tucker Carlson either. <laughs> and that, for instance, even if they don't like what's happened in the border in the last four years. They also right. don't like a, the idea of having a network of detention camps set up along sure. with forcibly deporting millions and millions of people. That's it. That for That's most it. Americans, it is a both and not either or policy. That they want to have order at the border, but a sympathetic path, for, a, for a sympathetic approach to people who have been living here for a long time that can be linked to a path to citizenship eventually. Immigration is just a symbol for how I think Democrats should think about these cultural war issues more generally. That recognizing the limited appeal of a kind of cosmopolitan progressive cultural stance right. doesn't mean going 
all the way to the other side and buying into the polarized deathmatch cultural framework. That's the way to turn yourself into the caricature that Republicans want to run against saying in a way that among others, Barack Obama did in 2004, that there is no red America, there's no blue America, and that there is still, even if politics distorts this, if it turns us into funhouse mirror versions of ourselves, that there is a middle ground and that Democrats are the party to speak to it. Very good. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today, Timothy. Uh, Folks, Timothy Schenk, a really smart thinker about our politics and about where both parties are evolving, has a great new book coming out on October 8th called Left Adrift, What Happened to Liberal Politics? Um, I recommend it. I think you guys should uh, go out and get it wherever fine books are sold. Timothy, thank you again for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. All right. We'll see you again next time. (laughs) Folks, nobody's eating dogs. Nobody's eating cats. This is one of the most outrageous things that has come out. It has been vomited out of the maw of the MAGA political media propaganda sewer in a long time. The lie Trump told on the debate stage that dogs and cats are being eaten by Haitian migrants is a lie. It is a lie from top to bottom. No matter how many bullshit AI-generated claims you see from the MAGA world, it's a lie. What is not a lie is now Haitian families in Ohio are under attack. We've got bomb threats. We've got death threats. We've got people attacking Haitian legal immigrants to this country. It is foul. It is disgusting. It is ill. It is a sign of a sick political party and a sick political culture. Laura Loomer, who has now become a most uh, a very important Trump advisor, has been pushing this goddamn foul bullshit. They've been pushing it out on this on the, the the sewer pipes of the MAGA propaganda system, like Truth Social and Gab. Who the fuck knew Gab was still around? Um, and, and on various channels. Uh, on Telegram and Discord. The lie comes from a guy named Christopher Paul House, who runs the Blood Tribe. It's a neo-Nazi channel on Telegram. And they started to spread the bullshit. They started to spread the lie. Donald Trump, of course, has taken the lie and run with it. Okay? It's now being echoed by the Russians and their and their various amplifiers and sycophants. Hello, Benny Johnson, Tim Poole, J.D. Vance, um, and it has become something that is going to get people killed. It is going to get Americans uh, fired up who do not know better than to believe this racist crap and go out and they're going to attack Haitians because they think they're killing their cats and their dogs. It's a lie. It's a lie from top to bottom. Everyone involved in the lie should be ashamed of it, and yet they feel no shame because they have no moral center, they have no ability to stop themselves from lying because they love owning the libs. When Donald Trump says they're eating the cats, they're eating the dogs, they're eating the pets, you know it's a lie, he knows it's a lie. But unfortunately, too many fucking morons in the MAGA movement do not know it's a lie. This is one of the things that you are gonna see more of as this campaign ends complete lies generated by AI bullshit generated by MAGA propagandists who do not care whether or not people are harmed or even killed because of their lies. Guys, this is one of the things you should know will keep you forever on the enemies list.